fishing? Who's fishing? I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, so it'll be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell a story, so it will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was loud. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Jesse Rook. I'm one of the pastors here at Marlton UMC. It's good to see you today as we are coming to worship the living God. Uh, today we are talking about uh, Jesus on the shoreline with the disciples as they have breakfast uh, and they catch 153 fish. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Today, Ed Waters is worship leader. Ed's going to come up, lead us in our call to worship and announce our first song. I'll be back in a little bit. and exalt. O earth, break forth. O mountains, into singing. The Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on those suffering ones. The song is goodness of God. Please stand. Please stand. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, 
I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I have known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Your son revealed to himself again and again and convinced his followers of his glorious resurrection. Grant that we may know his risen presence. In love, obediently feed his sheep and care for the lambs of his flock until we join the hosts of heaven in worshiping you and praising him over mercy of blessing and honor, glory and power forever and ever. Are there any other kids that want to join us at the table this morning? All right. All right, we're gonna have some fun. So I have a bag of goodies this morning. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty excited too. All right, so what is this? A fish, it's Dory. Right, yeah, so this is my friend Dory, who's a fish from Finding Nemo, which is more my time. Or finding Dory, which is more your time. <laughs> I didn't know the name of they did, yeah. So this is my friend Dory. She's gonna hang out with us this morning. Do you know what this is? A net? Oh my goodness! It just yeah, it just keeps going. Um, yeah, so you can use it to fish, right? So I wonder what it would be like to 
fish, I can't even get it, <laughs> with this. Can you imagine what that would be like? Do you want to try it? Yeah. Why don't we try it? Come on, Charlotte. You can hold the other side. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, tr imagine like trying to catch a bunch of dories with a net like that. I don't know about you, and I'm no fishing expert, but my arms don't seem long enough to hang over a boat and catch 153 fish. That's pretty silly, huh? All right. So we're going to sit back down for a minute. I'm going to talk a little more. So the disciples, with Jesus' help, caught 153 fish so that they could have breakfast on the beach with Jesus. And so the interesting thing about this story is that the disciples went back to fishing. Fishing for the disciples is like lacrosse might be for you, Charlotte, or karate might be for you, Ivy, it's, or field hockey, or I like to knit, so it's knitting for me. It's activities that make us happy, and they give us comfort when we're not sure what's happening next. And so the cool thing is, when we gather around the table with our goldfish, or when we gather around the communion table later um, in church, or when we gather around our tables at home with our families to share a meal, Jesus is with us in every single one of these activities. How cool is that? Jesus is with you on the lacrosse field. Jesus is with you as you do karate. Jesus is with me as I sit and knit. Jesus is always with us because he loves us. Let's pray. Hey, God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving all people. Help us to remember that you are with us in all of our activities each and every day. We pray this in your name. Amen. After these things, Jesus showed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, that, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able, I'm sorry, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish that the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter it is the Lord when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea but the other disciples came into the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land only about a hundred yards off when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught, you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? because they knew it was the Lord. 
Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. They were delicious. Friends, let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. So, there's a joke that I know. It's actually a skit from when I was a Boy Scout. And usually you do it with two or three people, but I'm going to do it all by myself. So prepare yourselves. One day, a man decides to go ice fishing. So he grabs his stool. He sits down on it. He pulls out his saw. He cuts a hole in the ice, lifts up the ice and lets it fall to the ground, drops its fishing line, and starts ice fishing. Suddenly, from the heavens, a big, booming voice comes out and says, Okay, God. So the man picks up his stool. He goes to another spot. He sits down. He carves into the, into the ice, pulls out the big chunk of ice and drops it, drops his fishing rod into the water and waits. And the big booming voice comes. I'm not going to do it as loud this time. There are no fish in there. All right, God. Well, there are no fish over there. There are no fish in here. Let me try over here. The man sits on his stool. He carves out the ice. He throws it down. He puts in his fishing rod, and he waits. And the big booming voice comes over. There are no fish in there. The man stands up. God, what gives? There were no fish in the first spot. There were no fish in this spot. There were no fish in the other spot. God, where are the fish? The voice from the heavens comes out again. This is not God. It's the ice rink director. Stop cutting holes in our... Now, I'm sure the disciples weren't ice fishing in Tiberias. Uh, The Sea of Tiberias, which is also the Sea of Galilee in some of the other Gospels. But I think it's fascinating and wonderful that we have a God who shows up, who tells us where the fish are, whether or not we're in an ice skating rink or not. Friends, first and foremost, I want to thank Joe for covering for me last week. I had a wedding. Uh, Joe's not here. It's Jake's sixth birthday and They're headed to a birthday party, but I did want to say thank you to Joe and happy birthday to Jake. Um, We are in a new series where we are looking at the resurrected Jesus and the ways in which he shows up to the disciples after the resurrection. So last week we saw uh, Jesus appears um, to Thomas and to the other disciples. He appears behind locked doors. He says to Thomas, put your hands in my hands, put your hand in my side. And then John tells us that today, that this is the third and final time that Jesus appears to the disciples. Now, uh, Matthew and Luke have other uh, appearances, and we're going to look at those too. The difference is John is just focusing on the ones that are to all of the disciples or to a big group of them. The ones in Matthew and in Luke that we're going to see are just for a couple of people. This is the, the road to Emmaus where only two disciples show up. Um, the Great Commission, where only a handful of the disciples were there. But John starts us in in John uh, chapter 21. He says, Gathered together was Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, or I'm sorry, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples who we don't know about. And what's fascinating to me this week is that this text doesn't end up the way I thought it was going to end up. This is the third and final time that Jesus shows up to his disciples in John, and I, for one, expect something big to happen. 
But what we see, and what Ed read today, is a pretty ordinary story, especially for the resurrected Jesus. Seven of the disciples are gathered together. They're trying to figure out what comes next. Peter decides to go fishing. And if you remember all the way back to John 1, Peter was already a fisherman. So were the sons of Zebedee. Thomas and Nathaniel weren't, or at least the Bible doesn't tell us what they were doing. Let's just assume that they weren't fishermen, and we don't know about the other two, but I'll just assume that they're not as well. Peter looks around at the others and says, I'm going to go fishing. Let's go ice fishing today. We'll find the closest ice rink near us, and we're going to go ice fishing. So the other disciples follow him. Now, I don't know why Peter wanted to go back. It's an interesting question and one that we're going to dive into in Bible study this week. Why does Peter want to go back to fishing? Was he just bored? Did he need money? Was he waiting and, and, and just trying to wait and see what was going to come next from Jesus and he wanted to do something to occupy his time? Did he miss the water? And he needed to get back out onto the water because if he wasn't allowed to work, then he wasn't worth anything. If someone took his fishing net away from him, then he had to question who he was. So the disciples go out all night. And thank, thank you, Alyssa, for the fishing net. I, I think that's a great illustration. The, they're out all night fishing, and they don't catch anything and then the morning comes, and there's a stranger on the ocean. About 100 yards away, so further than me to, to rob, pretty much the length of this sanctuary. They can't tell it's Jesus, and he calls out to them anyway and says, throw your net to the other side of the boat and see if you can catch anything there. So the disciples catch the fish. One of the disciples turns to Peter and says, it is the Lord. And Peter, so excited, jumps overboard and runs slash swims to his Savior. While the other disciples are left bringing the boat in and holding on to the fish so they don't get away. Now here's the extraordinary part for me. It's the resurrected Jesus. He came back to life. He came back because he wasn't finished, surely he's going to give them something. Surely he's going to tell them a new uh, lesson. He's going to make some explanation. He's going to show up and, and show them something wonderful or miraculous. Surely Jesus is going to come back and change their minds or their behavior. Surely something new has to happen. Or else why does Jesus show up? And that's what's fascinating for me about this scripture. It's so ordinary. Jesus only talks four times. And I don't have it on the screens this week, and I apologize for that. But Jesus only talks four times in this chapter. He says, children, you have no fish, have you? Then he says, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Then, once Peter gets on board, he says, bring some of the fish that you have caught. And then finally, when all the disciples are there, he says, come and have some breakfast. It's so ordinary. I can't stand it. Where is the burning bush? Where is the lightning and the clouds on the mountain? Where is Jesus walking on water or healing people or raising people from the dead? Where is the extraordinary Jesus in this story? Because do you know what the miracle actually is today? It's not the 153 fish. That's, that's a big catch and the net should have broke, but that's about it. Do you, know what, do you really want to know what the miracle was? That the net doesn't break. That's the miracle that Jesus performs today. He doesn't teach them something groundbreaking. He doesn't change their minds or open their minds to the scriptures. He doesn't impart the Holy Spirit. He doesn't heal anybody or save anybody or resurrect anybody. Jesus causes the net to hold. There are times in a disciple's life that are, are burning bush moments. 
There are moments in a disciple's life that you are standing at the mountain of God and you see the storm and the thunderclouds pass by. There are moments in the, time, in the life of a disciple that you're in the valley of the shadow of death and you are looking for a way out. There are times in the life of a disciple where we need our Savior. And then there are times where the net doesn't break. There are times in the life of a disciple that are just breakfast on the beach. This is what you get. Five minutes before service starts, Andy texts me. Sure you did? Andy texts me and goes, where are all the people from Easter? So I write back, they're gardening. There are times in a disciple's life where we want a full sanctuary. There are times in a disciple's life where we want successful ministries, where we want an entirely full children's table or uh, playground, where we want little ones playing on the, on the toys, where we want moms here and kids crying, and we want people we haven't seen in a while, and we want visitors and guests. And, and there are times in a disciple's life where we wonder, where did everybody go? Let's just go back to fishing. There are times in a disciple's life where we look and we say, wow, that is boring. This is Jesus. He has a charcoal fire there. And and John is intentional to tell us it's a charcoal fire. This is the youth group is having um, uh, camp or fireside chats. Fireside chats today. We are going to burn wood because I'm not magical enough to make fire just spontaneously happen. Jesus is, right? He could. He could light something on fire. He could have these fish and bread already cooked. He could have shown up miraculously, but John is is showing us enough that he says, no, it's a simple charcoal fire. This fish and the bread that Jesus has, it's not leftovers that we could use to feed 5,000 people. This isn't fish and bread that that are going to perform this amazing miracle that's going to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to over 5,000 people. This is fish and bread to feed seven disciples. Friends, there are some times where we expect an amazing and wonderful God that we worship to show up to give us strength when we need it, to comfort us when we are mourning, to show up and provide us healing when we are in the hospital, to 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 help us and to push us and to, to guide us, to walk with us through the shadow of the valley of death. There are times when our God shows up. And he shows up and he, it is gangbusters when he does. But there are also times in our lives, it's a cup of coffee with a friend. It's breakfast on the beach. It's sitting in a hospital room and praying because we're just annoyed and frustrated because there is no healing to be found. There are times, and they are ordinary times, where it is breakfast on a beach because, friends, that is where God also shows up. God shows up on the highest mountains, and God shows up on the lowest valleys, but God also shows up in the ordinary, boring parts of life. And thank God he does. Thank God he does. Can you imagine if God didn't? Can you imagine what that would be like if, if in God only showed up on the big days and you were left to your own devices on the, on the small days? Can you imagine what it would be like if, if you only expected God to show up on the mountaintops or the valleys but not on the day-to-day life? Because I'm a pastor. I'll tell you, for the majority of us, for the majority of us in the room and the majority of us watching online, most of our lives are the ordinary days. Most of our lives are the ordinary flat days. They are not the mountains or the valleys. They are the flat days where we are just trying to get through it. It's easy to be a Christian when everything is going well. It's easy to be a Christian when you are celebrating the birth of a child or you are celebrating a marriage or you are celebrating an Easter-packed Sunday. It is easy to be a Christian on the mountaintops. It's not as easy in the valleys, but at least we have someone to turn to. The days where we are, when we are mourning, the times where we are struggling, where we are hoping for, for, for healing, 
where we are waiting for recovery, the times when we are in darkness and we only turn to the light of the universe, those are also easy times to be a Christian. They're not easy in our lives, but it is easy to turn to Christ in those moments. The harder parts of the journey of a disciple is the boring days. It's the lacrosse games. It's the fishing days. It's, it's going out and, and having coffee with a friend just because you want to spend time with them. It's showing up on a Sunday that's not Easter. Not that there's anything boring about what we're doing today. It's showing up to men's group last night and just having a conversation. And we didn't hear anything groundbreaking yesterday. We didn't talk about anything we haven't heard before. We didn't find something new or something miraculous. We didn't all gain a whole bunch of understanding that we didn't have before. We just sat together and talked. I visited Dan in the hospital this week. I didn't bring oil to anoint him. I didn't lay hands on him that he would be healed. I, I prayed that the doctors would have wisdom and that Dan would have patience. We worship an amazing God. It's interesting, this breakfast on the beach, this ordinary meal. Because it's just bread and fish. And I'm allergic to fish. So the goldfish are the closest I get. I am, yeah. Oh, it would be really bad, Charlotte. I, I, never mind. We'll, we'll talk about it later. These are ordinary elements, ordinary food that become extraordinary because Christ is there. In a few minutes, we're going to celebrate communion. And uh, sometimes I hear from folks who say, why every time we eat communion, you talk about communion? Because it's important, and we should. Because this bread and this cup, Shane was asking me earlier, he says, would it be sacrilegious if I were to sell communion bread at a bake sale? It's a really good question. I know, it's so much bread. We're having real bread today, friends. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Although I do need Alyssa to go into the kitchen and go get me some of the fellowship cups. Por favor. Thank you, because I messed up. Shane asked, could we sell communion bread at a bake sale? Valid question. Valid. Wait, what does the congregation think? No, we should not sell communion bread. Raise your hand. Man, you guys are too good. Oh, Bob says no. Bob says no. Get it out of here. How about yes? Who says, I don't know? I don't know. The I don't knows, I'm fine with the I don't knows. All right. Let me, l let me lay it down for you real quick. These elements, the bread and the grape juice, are ordinary elements. I bought this at ShopRite. It, you're worthy of fresh-baked bread. It just wasn't going to happen this morning. They are just bread and they are just juice. Nothing extraordinary is in them. They are the same thing that you could eat at home. During our communion service, because we are all here together, the elements, the bread and the juice are ordinary, and God makes them extraordinary. They don't change. There's still bread and there's still juice. At the molecular level, they stay bread and juice, but God makes them into something holy. God makes them extraordinary. God sets them apart for holy use, which is why we, we wouldn't sell consecrated communion bread. I wouldn't bless this bread and break it and then serve it to all of you and then go back and sell the other half of the loaf. First off, ew. Secondly, that's just not what we would do. Same with the grape juice. Thank you. Same with the grape juice. At, my, uh, <laughs> at a church that I served... I don't know if I should tell this story. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So this is a story that, well, I don't know. We'll find out. So after service, I used to have to run to my second church um, and, and leave quickly. And so we'd have a communion steward who would prepare the bread and the juice and then, um, and then uh, take care of the table after I left church. So one week we had a baptism and I stayed there longer than normal. And I watched my communion steward, so she had a cane, um, and she couldn't go down the stairs. We didn't have an elevator at this church. So she had struggled going up and down the, the, the stairs. 
So I saw her one day, she takes the chalice of the grape juice, she opens the fire door, the fire exit door, and she tosses the grape juice out onto the fire escape. And I went, oof, okay. That's a teaching moment. We are supposed to, uh, 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 with dignity, take care of the elements from communion. We're supposed to either eat them or drink them solemnly, or you can uh, return them to the ground. Pour them out gently. You're not supposed to go to a fire exit door and toss them out the door and the window. These are ordinary elements. They are ordinary bread and water. You, um, during the pandemic, we saw this. We had communion with goldfish, with crackers, with bread, with with uh, mashed potatoes one person did one time. I saw someone who had communion with pizza. You, the, 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 the communion elements are ordinary. It's God who is extraordinary. And then God makes the ordinary extraordinary. And so <laughs> this is all a long way to say that God shows up not just on the high and the low days, but on the calm days. I told Alyssa this week, she was like, how, how are you feeling about your sermon? I'm like, it's an ordinary sermon because God's still going to show up and I'm okay with that. So friends, this week, in your ordinary days, invite God. I mean, it turns out God's already there. But invite God. Invite the fact that you might recognize God in those ordinary moments because God can make the ordinary extraordinary. God can make the ordinary holy. God can make your breakfast or your coffee or your friendship or your conversations extraordinary. God can show up. And it will only show up, well, it turns out, will show up even when we don't expect him to. The disciples thought Jesus was far away. They went back to fishing because that's what they did. And Jesus shows up even then and there. Amen. Friends, as we continue our worship, uh, this is the time for our prayers and uh, thanksgiving, the sharing of our prayers from the congregation. How is it with your soul today, and what can we lift up in prayer as we continue our worship? Russ. It's easy, Russ, I think, to... uh, It's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to, uh, to say, well, we know that that's still happening and that's okay and focus on something else. And so, yes, I think we need to continue to pray for peace and for a just resolution uh, to the invasion in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, Dan is uh, offering a prayer of thanksgiving, and uh, we are offering a prayer of thanksgiving uh, for you as well, brother. Um, Dan was in the hospital for a couple of days this week and um, is thanking uh, God for the prayers and the community that surrounded him. Lord, in your glory, hear our prayers. And a special prayer for Kathy, who uh, caregivers get it the worst. And so for Kathy and for all the caregivers, um, Lord, give them strength and Mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Betty. Mm. Amen. For friendships and for continuing friendships, um, God, in your glory, hear our prayers. Amen. (laughs) Uh, For comfort and healing and peace in a time of mourning, but also thanksgiving for your Father, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. All right. Friends, let's go before the Lord in prayer.
It will. I'm going to switch over to the uh, pulpit. Gracious Lord. Lord, we know that you show up in the extraordinary days. That you show up when we want to worship, that you show up when we praise your name, that you show up on the, on the awful days, the days where we need your presence and we need your support, the days that we turn to you and our lips form your name. But God, you also show up in the ordinary days. The days in which we just shrug our shoulders and say, okay, here we are. God, you show up when the disciples went fishing. You show up when we decide to go ice fishing. You show up at this table that we are about to surround. You show up at our tables at home. You show up when we wash our hands, when we sit with a neighbor, when we drink a cup of coffee in solitude. God, you show up. And we are thankful, and we stand in awe of a God who shows up just because. God, surround us, especially in these specific ways, these specific prayer requests that we have lifted up to you. God, show up. Let your Holy Spirit descend. May the Holy Spirit descend and abide within us and give us healing. Give us peace. Give us comfort and joy. God, please show up. For all those ways that we prayed this morning publicly and those ways in which we pray privately those concerns or joys that are on our hearts and on our minds and on our lips, those concerns that we lift to you now silently. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived, who died on a cross, who came back and continued to teach us and show us and show us who you are and whose we are. It's that same Jesus, Lord, that we pray today. And all God's people said, amen. Our hymn of response is Trust and Obey. The words will be up on your screen. Please stand in body or in spirit. I'll be right back. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and we all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey, not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly Pay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But to trust and obey.
bear, but we never can prove the delights of His love until all who He alter we lay for the favor He shows, for the joy He bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Friends, as we continue standing, uh, we have a chance to confess our faith. The Apostles' Creed is an ancient way in which Christians have together said, this is who we are, and this is what we believe. So let us join together and confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Friends, Christ invites to his table all who earnestly confess of their sins and repent and turn to one another in reconciliation and forgiveness. Let us pray this prayer of confession that is up on the screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And I think we're having some technical difficulties. That's probably my fault, Shane. Sorry about that. Um, friends, as uh, we are forgiven and reconciled people, it is our duty to pass the peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace with our neighbors, a, uh, a hug, a handshake, a fist bump, whatever it is. Pass the peace this morning. And you may be seated. So today, uh, during our offering, we're taking two offerings today. It is, uh, we're taking our regular general offering that we take every week. Um, these uh, funds help us to do ministry, to do ministry with the little ones, to do ministry with youth group, to go out into the community and continue to do ministry. Uh, we are finding ways and new ways to continue to do so. We're also taking a special communion offering today. Um, today in the United Methodist Church is Native American Ministry Sunday. In the back of uh, the chairs, you'll find some of these um, little cards. Uh, this is uh, the ways in which the United Methodist Church comes together and serves specifically uh, in uh, Native American ministries. So you can find more information here uh, on this card in the back of the pews. Um, you can donate uh, to the Native American Ministry Sunday Fund 
up here, uh, either during the offertory or when you come up for communion. Um, there's a plate in the back for the general fund, or you could put it up in the front, just write general fund on your envelope or your check. Um, I see Ed standing. Were we going to do, we're not going to do plates, right? Okay, we're doing plates next week. We're not going to pass the plates today. Um, so let us continue our worship by the giving of our time, our talents, our treasures, our witness, and our prayers. The praise band's going to play. I'll be right back. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high, soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love to all life thou givest to both great and small in all life thou livest the true life of all we blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish but not change as thee thou reignest in glory thou dwellest in light thine angels adore thee all veiling their sight all Lord we would render, O oh, help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You may be seated. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You created us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time of your kingdom had come. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from captivity to slave and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When he ascended and to sit in honor and glory at your right hand, he promised to be with us until the very end of the age. On the night in which he was to give himself up for us, he sat with his disciples and he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, Father. He gave it to his disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in response to these amazing acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering to us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and cup, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence that we are children of God, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, because we are one body, we eat from one loaf. And because we are one body, and because we, drink, we eat from one loaf, we drink from one cup. Friends, the table is set. It's not I who invites you to this table. It's Jesus. You don't need to be a member of our church. You don't need to be a Methodist. You don't even have to identify as a Christian. The only requirement is that you feel an urge to come forward and receive an ordinary meal but one that has been turned extraordinary. Today we're receiving communion by intinction because it's been a little while and because in my experience we have some former Catholics in the house. Uh, I just want to explain what that means. Intinction means I will give you a piece of bread and Alyssa will be holding the chalice. Uh, You take the bread, you dip the bread into the cup and then you eat both elements together, bread and juice. If you accidentally eat your piece of bread, don't drink from the cup. I'll just give you another one. (laughs) Plenty to go around. This is a meal for all. Do not drink from the cup. I will give you bread. We've also blessed uh, the fellowship cups, the cups we have been receiving. So if you wish, you can receive uh, using the bread and uh, cups that are in these fellowship containers. Um, Uh, If you don't want me to hand one out to you, they'll be on the Lord's table. Just come and grab one. Um, And if you're going to bring communion home to someone, please make sure to bring enough for yourself and that person and anyone else within your household. That's all I can think of. Come as you feel called, but under the direction of the communion steward, um, which is Ed, and if Alyssa will come up to help me with the chalice. Oh, and um, please don't trip over any of the prey ground items. I'd have to say, the body of Christ, broken for you.
Have all received who wish to receive? We don't have a prayer of thanksgiving, do we? That's right. I'll pray one. Oh, no, we do. Do we, or is that just a title? That's just a title. That's on me. Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this gift in which you have given yourself to us, this ordinary meal that you have made extraordinary. God, grant that we may go out into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. A couple of announcements before we head out in song. Uh, we're having confirmation tonight at 4, youth group tonight at 5. Normal spots uh, for youth group. We're having hot dogs and a campfire out front of the hub. Um, so join us at 5. I don't know what order they're in, so Shane, just go ahead and hit the first one and I'll do it. Bible study, 7.30 on Thursdays. All are invited. It's on Zoom. Um, it's a unique study. We're only going for a couple more weeks and then... Uh, We're going to take a pause in June uh, for the summer. So if you want to get on Bible study, if you've been like, "Um, I'll just go next week, I'll go next week, I'll go next week. You only got like four more next weeks until uh, we're going to pause it for a little bit. So please join us 7.30 on on, uh, Thursdays on Zoom. Next announcement. Our book study is continuing on. Uh, We have one extra copy of The Measure of a Man in the back. You can also get it online. Uh, on Kindle uh, or on Amazon. If you uh, have any uh, questions, reach out to Andy or to Ed Waters. What's the next one? Can't actually see it. Coffee. Are you doing coffee this week? You're not doing coffee this week. Ignore this slide. Don't look at it. Pretend it doesn't exist. Go to the next one. That's all we have. Uh, There's also a Mother's Day announcement. Alyssa's going to come up for the Mother's Day announcement because I don't remember it. Hey, Will, can we turn on the pulpit mic? Good morning. So I would like to extend the invitation to all of you as you leave today to notice the bulletin board at the bottom of the steps outside of Janet's office. Uh, There is space for you to add a picture of your mother to the bulletin board. I promise you will get it back. Um, May 15th, you can take it home with you. But this is just a small way in which we want to celebrate and honor and remember all of the mothers and mother figures in our lives who have shaped us and helped us to be who we are. So I hope that you will add to our bulletin board. If you don't have a photo but you still want to contribute, there's note cards down there, and you can write a memory or a lesson or something that she taught you and add it to the board. Thank you. Are there any other? Oh, Casey's got an announcement. Um, choir, we won't have rehearsal today, um, but we will have bells Wednesday. And I think for choir, we're going to make our new rehearsal spot the chapel downstairs. Nice. That way you can all sneak out at 11. Perfect. So uh, no, no choir uh, today, choir next week, bell choir Wednesday at 7, whatever, at 7. You know what time you're supposed to show up. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church? Janet? Janet says nothing. Praise God. Our closing hymn is Victory in Jesus. Please stand in body or in spirit. Uh, I'll be back for the benediction. All right, maybe you need something with like a bigger base, you know? Like maybe make a square instead of just a rectangle. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. How 
how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning from his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused blind to see. And then I cried, did Jesus come and heal my broken spirit? And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loves me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. In the bread and the juice, in the flame, in breakfast and in coffee, and in the giggle of little kids as they're trying to build the tallest tower they can. <laughs> Friends, this is what it means to be in community. This is what it means to have a church that has little ones who are comfortable enough to giggle. And it's funny. Friends, go in peace. Know that God loves you. Know that God has called you. Know that God has said, here I am. Find me. And so, friends, in response, we must reach out and look for God as well. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing uh, song is our congregational theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's just do this one a cappella.